Hey, I'm Josh Hawkins, and this is episode 48 of Opening Up the Gospels. In the last few episodes, we've been looking at some of the first few events in this section of Jesus's ministry I'm calling the Early Judean Period. Last time, we looked at the wedding of Cana up in Galilee and how Jesus had turned perhaps 150 gallons of water into exceptionally tasting wine. Though not many people would have known about what had happened, Jesus not only covered the embarrassment of the family, but for the first time, he revealed his glory in creating wine from water. What was it like for the couple who got married to reflect back and think about God in the flesh at their wedding? Did the one in charge of the feast ever tell the couple the story of what really happened? There's so many things to meditate on with that scene. After the wedding, John 2.12 tells us that Jesus returned to Capernaum with his mother, brothers, and disciples, and he stayed there several days. What happened during those few days that he was back among his family, friends, and acquaintances? Did questions about Jesus' whereabouts come up over their meals? What about what happened at the wedding just a few days before? Don't pass by this verse too quickly. Feel the nearness of God to us in the Incarnation. This is the creator of all in a small lakeside village in Israel. And the God of Mount Sinai had siblings. Oh, don't let this get old. Today I want to continue in John 2 and start to look at an extremely important scene, the cleansing of the temple. We'll spend a couple of episodes here. Let's read in John 2. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So when and where is this happening? Well, Jesus is now in Jerusalem in the southern part of Israel in the region of Judea. Specifically, he's in the temple, which is basically the heart of everything Jewish. We'll look closer at the temple in a second. And looking at our timeline, we can actually place this event with a lot more precision than some of the other things we've been looking at. Jesus was baptized in early 27, followed by his 40 days in the wilderness, and then the week or so with the events around Bethany beyond the Jordan before he heads north to Galilee. Then he spends at least a few days in Cana for the wedding before heading to Capernaum with his family and disciples. Then John says the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Passover always began on the 15th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan and lasted for seven days. This roughly corresponds to the month of April in our calendars, and because of the way that both our modern calendar and the Hebrew calendar cycles, the actual day on the modern calendar is different every year. So for the rest of this series, I'll be referencing Passover as happening in April. Let's talk about the temple for a little bit. Before I started looking at the Gospels in more of an in-depth way, I used to just think that the temple was basically the size of a church building that would hold a few hundred people, and that it was just full of gold and animal blood and bearded men wearing robes. (laughs) But I realized that the temple we read about in the Gospels, also called Herod's Temple, just meaning that the temple that Herod was in charge of building, it was such a magnificent structure. It literally was one of the wonders of the ancient world, and nothing rivaled its beauty, not even anything in Rome or in Greece. Because of all the gold and the marble used in its construction, the light would reflect off of it when the sun or the moon was shining. It was like a magnificent blazing gold reflection. In Jewish tradition, there was a proverb that said, he who has not seen the temple of Herod has never known what beauty is. Wow. Not only was the temple beautiful in its appearance, but it was much larger than many people think. The temple proper was bounded by a courtyard, which the Jewish historian Josephus said held up to 210,000 people. Think about that. 210,000 people. Now, Josephus was known for exaggeration at times, so it could be that he's exaggerating again in this specific instance. But even if he doubled the number, that would still indicate that the courtyard could hold 100,000 people. The largest stadium in America is Michigan Stadium, where the Michigan Wolverines play football. The capacity of Michigan Stadium is 109,000 people. Look at all those people. I mean, imagine all of those people in the courtyards of the temple. But everyone in the stadium is organized in nice rows and sections in the bleachers, but everyone in the temple is just on one flat area where everyone's just teeming and crowded there. 
Now, Josephus also said that the city of Jerusalem would swell to nearly 2 million people during the Feast of Passover and Tabernacles. But let's just assume Josephus was exaggerating. Let's cut that in half again. 1 million people in a city in antiquity? <laughs> now that's a big city. The retaining walls of the temple measured 1,590 feet on the west, 1,035 feet on the north, 1,536 feet on the east, and 912 feet on the south. When you put all that together and calculate the area, it would be roughly equivalent to the area of 35 American football fields. Stop and let that sink in for a second. 35 football fields, that place was huge. Inside the walls were areas that were commonly called porticos or porches, but don't think like the porch off of an apartment building or something. Think cloister or hall. These porches were areas where people would meet, where teachers would teach, and where there could even be a little bit of solitude when the temple complex was relatively empty. We read about these porches like Solomon's porch, for instance, throughout the Gospels and the Book of Acts. These porches all had a roof over them that was nearly 40 feet high. These roofs were supported by three rows of pillars, each cut out from a single block of marble. Now, inside the walls and beyond the porches was the actual temple, which I'll just call the temple proper. As you can see by the size comparison graphic, it still is quite a bit larger than a few football fields. And look at the size of Solomon's temple compared to the temple in Jesus' day. It's so much smaller. Inside the temple proper, you can see the various courtyards and chambers. While Gentiles were permitted in the temple courts, only Jews were allowed into the temple proper. You can also see the holy place and the altar just outside of it where the daily sacrifices were made. And inside the holy place, though it's a little small, you can see the veil and the holy of holies. We looked back at this a little bit in episode 12 when we looked at how Zechariah was chosen by lot to burn incense in the holy place. The Holy of Holies did not have God's glory dwelling in it in Jesus' day. That had left a long time ago, back when Ezekiel was prophesying. So the thick veil was just covering up an empty, dark room. If you think about it, that's really an indictment to the Jewish nation, because what had set them apart for so many years of their history was that they had Yahweh dwelling with them. I'll develop this point a little bit more in future episodes. So today we have so much mechanical technology to help us move large or heavy items like cranes, loaders, and forklifts. But when construction began on Herod's temple in 19 BC, there was no crane to be found. The first stage of the project was to expand the temple that Zerubbabel had built by constructing a massive platform. Mount Moriah is where the old temple sat, and it was a relatively small area. So what Herod did was to fill up some of the valleys around Moriah so that a platform was created on which the new structures could be built. The building of this platform caused the whole area to be elevated by nearly 170 feet. Now, some of the stones in the wall measured between 20 and 40 feet in length and could weigh even hundreds of tons. So, a thousand vehicles and 10,000 laborers were used to transport the stones. Imagine being part of that workforce. Take a look at this quote from the website of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. From the times of King Solomon to the return of the Babylonian exile in the Hasmonean period, 10th to 1st centuries BCE, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem was a relatively small platform built on top of Mount Moriah and its highest point was the Stone of Foundation. This was the site of the temple. King Herod's greatest building project was to double the area of the Temple Mount by incorporating part of the hill to the northwest, which had to be leveled and on which he built the Antonia Fortress, and by filling up parts of the surrounding valleys. Herod transformed the second temple into an edifice of splendor and surrounded the Temple Mount on its four sides with massive retaining walls. The walls, founded on bedrock, were built of large ashlar stones with beautifully dressed margins. Each course was set back about two to three centimeters from the course below it. The stones weigh some five tons each. The corner blocks, tens of tons. In this scene we're looking at in the Gospels in John 2, the Jews in Jerusalem said that work had been going on for 46 years. If the temple began construction in 19 BC, that puts us in 27 AD, just as I've noted before. The temple continued to be worked on throughout the time of Jesus and beyond. It wasn't fully complete until 63 AD, just seven years before its destruction by the Romans in 70 AD. 
I hope this brief little overview of the temple has helped you to get some perspective on what the gospel writers were talking about when they said the temple. And so when we think of Jesus cleansing the temple, we're not talking about a structure that was the size of a 500-member church where everyone looks and sees Jesus coming in the door and hears him disrupting everything. What we need to picture is something massive, something with the area of 35 football fields and perhaps where 100,000 people could be crammed in at one time. And of course, that means there might have been people in the temple that weren't even aware of the commotion that Jesus caused. But as we'll see in the next episode, it's so significant that Jesus opens his ministry with this very overt public act. Come back next time where we'll take a look at more details in John 2. If you've missed any of the past episodes, you can find them all on my website, www.joshuahawkins.com gospels. Be sure to subscribe now so you don't miss any of the future episodes. God bless. Thank you.